We've got a minute or so after 10 o'clock. We'll be together for about an hour and a half. I'll be talking to you this morning and welcome. Good morning. Thanks for joining me for our Medical Reserve Corps Volunteer Orientation. I'm Jennifer Freeland. I'm the State Volunteer Coordinator here at the Virginia Department of Health and the Office of Emergency Preparedness. And I welcome you um, as one of our new Medical Reserve Corps Volunteers. Today, um, you are pretty much at step two. Everybody probably has a completed um, and approved application. Uh, most likely, you've got a, an alert message from uh, Adrenia to invite you to today's orientation. Um, once you complete the orientation, we'll start your background investigation process. There's some few trainings that might be needed for you to serve in your role as a volunteer. We'll look at um, team assignment and then actual deployment. So in order to get down to that deployment part and to really focus on um, our role as a Medical Reserve Corps and your role as a volunteer, we're going to go over a few things today. We'll look at the mission and the purpose of the MRC, um, talk a little bit about public health and really um, in depth talk about our response for COVID-19. We want you to understand your roles, um, responsibilities, do's and don'ts. Um, we have two great systems, the Virginia Volunteer Health System and our learning management system. And then we'll talk about next steps. So I'm sure all of you aware that yesterday was 9-11. Um, and um, it is the reason for MRC. If you're on Facebook, I encourage you to go and read, uh, watch me reading our MRC story. But when people wanted to help, um, medical professionals wanted to help, there was no organized way for them to do so after 9-11. Many showed up and were turned away or were used in different ways that maybe were not safe um, and may, maybe not the best fit for them. Um, in response to that, um, President Bush actually made a large call out for um, citizens to volunteer and serve their communities. One of the programs that was created to support that was the Medical Reserve Corps program. We have a system called the Emergency System for the Advanced Registration of Volunteer Healthcare Professionals. You will never have to worry about that ESARVIP acronym. It's horrible. We call that in Virginia the Virginia Volunteer Health System. And our program um, nationally is housed under the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response in the Office of Emergency Management. In Virginia, um, our program is under the direction and leadership of the Virginia Department of Health and specifically our Office of Emergency Preparedness. And each local health district um, has MRC unit um, coordinators and um, either affiliated MRC units regionally. We are supported with, with grants from the Center for Disease Control, our public health emergency preparedness grant, hospital grant. Um, we have grants from the National Association of Kennedy City and Cal County Health Officials um, and a lot of other localities and federal funding. So just kind of wanted to say that, not only because we're appreciative of the funding that we received, we certainly would not be the robust program that we are without that funding. But we are not a 501c3. So we are not a, a Red Cross. Um, we do not raise money, uh, do not accept donations, cannot really accept any monetary donations, but we all of our funding is through grant funding. Um, and it is a government managed volunteer program to support ESAFA emergency, um, emergency response. So our volunteers, you, are really focused on protecting and improving the health of Virginians. And we do that in so many different ways. Um, we are very engaged in public health initiatives and also in emergencies. And I'm not gonna have the time to go through everything that we do at the local health departments and public health, um, but I'm gonna show just a few pictures to give you a, a snapshot of what MRC does for public health. Pictured here are some of our volunteers um, working at a homeless um, health outreach event in Virginia Beach. We have that in several areas of the state where we provide um, health screenings and education. We have teams of volunteers that go into schools and support community events and um, teach uh, children about hand washing. Um, I'm, we will be doing that about mask wearing and everything that we need to do for COVID, the six foot social distance. Um, so we are health educators. 
And we also work and address our opioid response uh, by supporting the drug take back initiatives in partnership with our public safety. So um, volunteers are out there collecting unused medication. Um, I can't take pictures of some of the other things that we do. We have volunteers that support our car seat programs um, that work in the local health districts to support our women, infant, and children program, um, STI clinics, um, Revive, Narcan dispensing. The list really goes on and on. But what I want you to know is, although we're very focused in COVID-19, um, we are actually still doing other public health um, uh, deployments at the same time. And during non-emergencies, there's a lot of opportunities for you to support your community. And I hope that your entry as a COVID-19 MRC volunteer will just mean that you'll continue um, to find other ways to serve your community um, through the Virginia Department of Health and the Medical Reserve Corps. In emergencies, um, VDH is responsible for coordinating medical, public health, and mental health services and um, emergency medical services. Now, we don't provide all those things. The local health department, <laughs> we struggle to provide just public health. Um, of course, we work with our partners to our hospitals, healthcare systems, our um, community health services, uh, the behavioral health services, and our EMS agencies, all to provide what is the, bar the much larger public health. Um, we are heavily involved and number one priority is um, conducting active disease surveillance and investigations. Obviously, um, we are doing that with COVID-19 and I'll give some examples. In emergencies, the Virginia Department of Health is responsible for putting pills in people's hands and shots in people's arms as quickly as possible. And one of the things I didn't mention about the start of our program was it was also started in response to the anthrax attacks in Northern Virginia. Um, we quickly realized that we didn't have enough people um, to help dispense Cipro or Doxy in the event of the anthrax attack. And that has to be done in, in expedited amount of time, really 24 hours we have to be dispensing medication. And um, volunteers, you are going to be a critical, um, <laughs> a critical piece to our mass vaccination efforts once COVID vaccine hits. And then supporting mass care and shelter operations. And actually this week, um, not far from where I live here in, in Suffolk, we had flash flood warnings and we had some very significant um, flooding, flooding out of roads and um, fairly small area. Uh, 10 community members had to be evacuated from their home. Um, we had an alert sent to our volunteers and within an hour and a half, we had three volunteers that were helping to staff a shelter to support their community members that have been evacuated. So those are kind of just some examples um, other than COVID-19, but this is, COVID-19 is not our first pandemic. It is not our first declared public health emergency. So we were heavily engaged in supporting H1N1 response. Um, volunteers supported mass vaccination and education out in the community. Um, in comparison to what we are doing now, um, it is small, um, but then it was mighty. Um, we are uh, exceeding <laughs> everything that we did for H1N1 currently with COVID. Um, Ebola, we have volunteers to help to do screening. So when we have people returning from other countries um, that need to be monitored, volunteers have assisted with that. Um, Zika, volunteers doing education and um, outreach to pregnant um, women. And then opioid um, addiction, we have volunteers that teach revive training, dispense the Narcan, um, and are out in their communities um, really addressing the opioid epidemic, which is um, you know, it started out being very significant many years ago out in the southwestern part of the state and of course has moved more statewide now. Let's go ahead and start our journey down our COVID-19 timeline. So in December, um, we learned that there was a, a virus, uh, the coronavirus in China. Um, March 7th, we had our first case in Virginia. Um, Medical Reserve Corps volunteers were already deployed before we had the first confirmed case in Virginia. Um, our Alexandria MRC unit was monitoring people that were returning from other countries. So we were boots on the ground before we had our first case. 
Um, and then we had pandemic declared, state of emergency. We all went into our first phase of quarantine and, and we just finally, everybody this week opened up to phase three. Um, and I know many of you are involved with uh, transitioning our children, many of them to all virtual learning or blended learning. Um, and that has definitely been the challenge this week. So kudos to you parents who have been doing that. Um, I know it's uh, been a stretch for all of us. So um, thank you because that really does um, help to uh, reduce our um, spread of the virus. And I know it's not easy for everyone, but it is important. Um, you may be aware that we have had some pretty significant outbreaks in a few colleges that have returned. Um, and I'll maybe chat a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so I am not a public health expert epidemiologist about COVID-19. Um, I struggle to keep up even with the information that's updated on our website. So I really encourage you that if you want to know what's going on in Virginia, that you go to our COVID-19 website. Um, all the data is updated. I just can't even begin to tell you how many people are working behind the scenes to make those numbers as accurate as possible. Um, our, our team in the Office of Epidemiology is just phenomenal. Um, and I'm definitely, I know a lot of people don't know that all the work that goes on behind the scenes, but I definitely appreciate what they do. And then if you want to help us or encourage your friends to use the COVIDWISE app, um, this is just an application that talks between phones. Um, we do not receive any personal identifiable information through COVIDWISE. Um, we only know that 82 people entered that they were positive. That's all we know. Um, and hopefully if people were around them and they were positive then other people were informed that they potentially could have been exposed to COVID-19 and can go get tested and can quarantine. So I um, encourage you to consider putting that on your phone and helping to avoid us um, add to our COVID-19 fight. Let's look now at, you know, that's kind of the background. Let's look at what we've really been doing. So we have some main missions um, and we've, we've chunked them out into mission sets, we like to call them contact tracing and epidemiology, um, which has been our largest, public information, infection prevention, testing, medical search, and vaccination. And I'm sharing with you, we, we will be doing a large celebration um, at the end of the month, but I'm giving you a little bit of a glimpse of how busy we've been. Um, so we volunteers have dedicated over 75,000 hours. Now that's just from February to the end of June. That doesn't include July, August, and up to today. Um, volunteers have left and served in 18,819 admissions or have gone out the door and filled that many requests so far. We send out messages in our Virginia Volunteer Health System in the month of June. It was over 87,000 text messages that were sent to volunteers. That just gives um, a little bit of a snapshot of how busy we've been. Um, and it's been incredible to see all the work that everybody has done. We see the stories, but really the impact is, is um, unprecedented and absolutely commendable. And at the very beginning, we started with contact tracing and epidemiology. Um, we had physicians that came in and helped to answer questions from healthcare professionals. Um, we have volunteers that have started work as contact tracers. Um, supporting the health department. Many of them were hired um, as contact tracers, volunteers serving as case investigators, doing data entry for the epidemiologists. Um, and we even have volunteers now that are backfilling positions. So they may not be working on COVID, but they might be working on a TB outbreak or um, a food outbreak. So they might be working on another area of epidemiology to really expand the capacity to do all of our emergency and non-emergency um, epi caseload. And by far the largest group of volunteers that we've had to support COVID-19 has been our public information efforts and call centers. And um, this is early on picture, so I know you're already starting to judge. I'm gonna show you how it's changed. 
No, they are not wearing masks, but they are ready. And see their shirts say, are you ready? This is the Alexandria MRC. They have been doing call center operations for six months staffed by volunteers. Amazing. And as we've gone through, that call center operations has changed to distancing with hand sanitation and now distancing, hand sanitation, and masks and everything. So we follow, of course, all CDC's guidance for, um, uh, for protection. And um, we haven't had any of our volunteers that have gone out in the field that have gotten COVID from um, serving in their community. So we do make sure that you are safe. Um, and really important that we have volunteers answering the phone. This helps to reduce fear of community members that have questions. Um, helps to make sure that they're connected to the services that they need. Some people don't have access to, um, you know, a, a primary care physician. They don't know where to get tested, if they need to be tested, and volunteers are there to answer those questions for them, um, medical and non-medical volunteers. Um, we train volunteers to do the call center, and um, you receive scripts, and there's a subject matter expert there. So that might be something, a way that you would like to serve. It's a fairly low-risk um, service opportunity. But volunteers also boots on the ground for us. And we have done a lot of community canvassing. This is really um, important when we've done our community testing events that volunteers have walked the neighborhoods and handed out flyers about testing events and invited people to get testing. Um, they've handed out um, information and masks um, to distribute to those community members. And this is a picture of some volunteers. I believe this was in Norfolk. Can't read the bag, but I think it's in Norfolk. Um, stuffing bags that were delivered, I believe, for individuals that came through a testing event. We do try to provide resources to people that don't have them. And we also have some virtual volunteer opportunities. Um, some of that epi investigation work is being done virtually. Um, some of it's in person. Uh, we have volunteers that have called around to different facilities to see what PPE they've needed. Um, we have volunteers that are on a mental health resiliency team. Um, there are lots of opportunities for online training. Um, actually, this past Thursday, uh, we had a cultural university training. We have a point of dispensing training come up. We, the next couple months, we've got trainings at least two to three times a month that are virtual trainings. Um, some of our volunteers have provided volunteer management support and also supporting our social media efforts. In person, we have been um, really busy with infection prevention. A lot of what health, really public health focuses on is prevention. And so we have volunteers that have been doing the point of entry screening at the local health departments. They've been doing it at some community courthouses where they take temperatures, um, make sure people are wearing masks and allow them to come in the building. Volunteers have also um, gone out and provided education out in the community about appropriately donning and doffing to other healthcare professionals. Also provided N95 fit testing. So volunteers are trained to do fit testing of N95 masks. Volunteers are also fit tested for N95 masks. If you're not a healthcare professional or really you've never worn an N95 mask before, you probably are not aware that um, it's not effective unless it fits your face. Um, N95 mask is much like a pair of shoes that come in different sizes, different models, different makes. Um, and we have to ensure that um, it's properly sealed and works correctly. So these hoods um, are part of that process. They put some bitter spray in there and if you taste it, then your mask doesn't work. Um, so that is um, a really um, important part of the prevention um, that we do. And we also were asked by the Department of Elections at the state level to do some infection prevention and encouragement of good social distancing and mitigation strategies at our polling locations. We've done that in May, June, and July, and we have gotten a very large request for volunteers for November. So if you're willing to um, go and meet with your registrars, um, you know, perhaps spend some time at your polling location, um, provide an advisement to the election officials because they, 
the actually the risk um, for elections is not so much the people that are voting. The greatest risk is the people that are serving there and are interacting with everybody that comes in that's voted because they're getting exposed to everyone. Um, and we want to protect the health of the poll workers and all the citizens that are voting and we want everybody to vote in person if that is what they would like to do. So it's a great opportunity. Um, and we deployed in June 660 volunteers in one day for um, our elections. I expect we'll probably have well over a thousand for November. Community testing, community testing, and more community testing. Um, we have we were the first community testing event that was done in a drive-through model was in um, Henrico. Um, at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was staffed 70% by Medical Reserve Corps volunteers in partnership with community partners. Um, we have done testing in all kinds of different settings. Um, these are some students in the parking lot and Virginia Tech doing testing. Um, so it's a drive up, walk up, come and see us, we'll test you model. Um, and every community is a little different. So what testing looks like in one location may not be the same in others. In the Loudoun County, they are actually doing what's called micro testing. So the four volunteers are actually walking almost door to door to different residents and offering testing. Um, and so we are trying to really be strategic about providing the testing in the areas where we um, there's indication that there's a higher number of cases and um, community members that don't have um, as much resources to obtain testing. In addition to um, testing, we have supported long-term care facilities. This is not a, a typical mission for us. This was a, an unexpected mission. Um, I think it is all sad to many of us to learn about the outbreaks and the number of deaths that have occurred in our long-term care facilities throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the nation. Um, and what unfortunately has happened in many of the facilities is that um, once an outbreak happens, um, a lot of the times it's brought in by the staff and when they're positive, they can't work. And when they've been exposed and potentially could become positive, they can't work. So there's nothing, uh, you know, very common for when there's an outbreak in a long-term care facility for up to 20 to 20 people plus not to show up to work the next day. Um, and that can be a huge gap. Um, we've had over 130 volunteers that have stepped up and served in long-term care facilities, either taking care of patients that were not COVID positive or taking care of COVID positive patients. Um, it is a struggle and um, a very desperate situation with a lot of these long-term care facilities. And it is absolutely admirable that many volunteers have stood up. We anticipated um, medical surge needs. Um, we, at the very beginning, you know, we saw what was happening in New York with the pop-up hospitals. We were planning to do similar, either on campus um, or hospital campus or looking at some convention centers and setting up um, mobile hospitals. We practice medical surge and hospital operations every year in Virginia Beach with the rock and roll and the shamrock marathons. We work alongside the hospital staff. So um, when we knew we were going to be shortage on staff, that was when um, the governor made the call for volunteers to step up to be able to support alternate care sites. Thankfully, we haven't had the need to do that. Currently, um, the trends that we see, even with what will look like to be our second kind of peak in October, it does not look like right now that we will exceed the hospital capacity, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so hopefully we won't have to set these up. But we have been setting these, their step tents, um, stabilization treatment and place tents, outside of some of the hospital doors um, in Suffolk area, in my area, and have providing testing in the, in the tents. We're trying to prevent the surge of people going into the EDs wanting to receive testing and thinking that the emergency department can get them testing faster. And instead, we've set up mobile testing staffed by volunteers in those locations. 
we say that those COVID-19 responses, um, like a marathon, obviously we've been at it for six months now. Um, and more than likely we've still got another at least <laughs> four months um, to go. And we're getting ready, or actually we've already started what is our last leg of this marathon, which is vaccination. Um, and it's not only the COVID vaccination, but we've been doing school vaccination and immunizations for several months. Um, because of COVID, many parents were not taking their children to get their vaccinations, and there's a huge gap with that. Regardless if they're virtual or not, vaccinations are still required. So um, volunteers have been assisting providing um, vaccinations to children in the community. We are currently doing flu vaccination. So our flu vaccine that we received through our public health emergency preparedness program to practice our ability to do mass vaccination actually arrived at our health departments last week. Today in the Eastern Shore, they are working with one of their federally qualified health centers and the MRC volunteers are doing a drive-through vaccination event in that community. Um, I've already seen them being scheduled throughout the state. Um, and if you are willing to support our vaccination team, um, we would love for you to be involved in our flu vaccination efforts so that we can develop a well-oiled machine for when COVID um, arrives. And this is a picture here of um, the Portsmouth MRC. It's in the parking lot in the back of Community Center. They do it every year. That's Miss Robin Booth. She's a, a longtime MRC volunteer and she's a vaccinator. And so um, they would, you know, drive up. It took me, um, I, I went to this clinic and got my vaccination. It took me less than 15 minutes to drive up, get my flu shot sit, wait, and, and roll out. So we really want to be able to have a quick um, uh, roll through, quick turnover in time of people um, so that we can get, um, much like we take that same model that we do for mass testing, mass uh, vaccination, and we, we did it for mass testing. And so with the mass testing, we were able to do in, uh, I think it was Arlington, Loudoun, and Fairfax, on a Saturday, 2,000 tests in one day. Um, so 2,000 tests, people walking, driving through and getting their, their tests, um, their COVID tests. And so that'll be our model. Those will be our standards for doing the vaccinations as well. So there will be community free flu um, vaccinations, and then we'll have the COVID vaccination efforts. And you know, as you know, um, when the vaccine gets here, um, if it's gonna be one dose or two doses, prioritization of who's gonna receive it first, all of that is in conversation and flux right now. Um, wanna let you know that if you are on our vaccination team, you will get your COVID vaccine first um, because you are part of the healthcare workforce and our public health workforce. So volunteers that support that effort will get their vaccination first. If you are um, at risk for COVID-19 and you wanna volunteer, you've been sitting on the sidelines, we would love to get you your vaccination so that you can start helping us and feel um, more safe and providing support out in the community. So stay tuned, we are ramping up um, plans um, and testing our vaccination plans and we are developing our teams currently. Um, nurses are um, in start have started the training um, process for doing uh, COVID and flu vaccination and have completed and are already doing it obviously. So let's talk about why we need volunteers. We need volunteers because we at the Virginia Department of Health have a very limited workforce. Um, a smaller workforce than we have ever had previously. And um, nurses, there's not a core of public health nurses um, out in our local health departments. Um, we also don't have skill sets that a lot of our healthcare providers have out in the community. And I think what's most important about why we need volunteers is we need other people that care about public health and their community members as much as we do. Um, our capacity is small, our heart is huge, and we need all kinds of help. I spoke to a local health director earlier this week, and we were trying to identify how medical students and MRC volunteers could help them. And we said, so, um, you know, uh, Dr. Gately, uh, what would you need? He goes, 
I will take all the help I can get. Um, our health departments have been stretched and they really need help. And who is needed is going to be based upon what type of support is needed. So um, he and I were talking, he's like, you know, I really need um, some folks that can help us with epidemiology, both my COVID, COVID epidemiologist and my regular epidemiologist. I need somebody that can come in and actually work with me. Um, so who is selected, who is notified, who gets deployed is going to vary by what the request is across the um, state. What one MRC unit is doing is going to be different than another. Um, so maybe you have an MRC volunteer friend that's in Northern Virginia and she told you um, about the great work that she's been doing and told you to join and you live in Norfolk. Um, it's probably not going to be the same and, and especially for out in the southwestern part of the state. And as you've seen, you know, our increased caseload has moved. Um, it was started out in Northern Virginia and now really southwestern Virginia is struggling a little more, especially um, in JMU. And why don't I use this as an opportunity to, to tell you a little bit about that. So, um, of course, we have a high case count of COVID um, on our JMU campus. They quickly, after about, I think it was three days of in-person classes, um, shifted to virtual operations. Um, they are requesting Medical Reserve Corps volunteers because their healthcare center staff at the university has been stretched. Um, they don't have the ability to continue to support as much COVID testing and as they would like and also to answer the phones from concerned students and provide triage. Um, they've hired some contract staff, but even we're struggling to find people to be able to do it for free. We had that problem in the, uh, not to do it for free, to do it for pay. We had problems hiring people in long-term care facilities. And, and, and just amazingly, we had volunteers like yourself that were willing to do an eight hour shift for free. Um, so the need for the workforce really varies according to where the outbreaks are um, and what are, whatever else is going on to um, mobilize that workforce. We had a larger availability of workforce when we were in phase one of quarantine. Phase three, people are getting back to their normal jobs, so nurses aren't sitting on the sidelines as much anymore because um, care is being provided. Um, so, you know, that's a very unique case that we're going to be providing support to JMU. And so if you're in that area and you would like to serve in that capacity, um, please reach out to me or the MRC unit coordinator, and I'm going to show you who that is in just a minute. Let's talk a little bit about who all these volunteers are that support us. Um, you know, we're doing a lot, we need you, and who are we needing and who do we have? Um, I say we have a sea of red shirts. Um, right now the COVID-19 shirts are, are kind of a, a burgundy color, um, but typically we wear red shirts like what I'm wearing. But our capacity is quite large and is significantly increased since, um, when we started at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, I had, we had about 10,000 approved volunteers, a little under that. Um, so within 120 days, we had onboarded orientation, background investigation, had volunteers that were able to deploy over 5,000 new volunteers in 120 days. Um, that was an emergency and a monumental <laughs> task into itself. Um, and so we had significantly increased our capacity by yourself and many other citizens who have stepped up to serve. And now we have over 12,000 deployable volunteers. This is um, just amazing. It's amazing that um, and humbling that so many people want to help and that we were able to get people where they needed to be and onboarded so that they could help. Now, I want you to know, I want you to make sure you know which MRC unit you're in and who your coordinator is. Um, so if you're in the southwestern part of the state, you've got Christina Morris. If you're near southwest, that's Mary Lou. If you're northwest, that's Thomas Jefferson, Central Shenandoah, Lord Fairfax, that's Chris Rainey. Um, Loudon is Fairfax, uh, Fairfax is Paula, uh, Arlington is Christina, Alexandria is Ionella, um, Prince William is Amy. We have Rappahannock and Ra Rappahannock Rapidan, it's Jessica. 
uh, Central Shenandoah, um, well, not Central Shenandoah, Henrico and Chickahominy, Alyssa, Three Rivers, Johanna, Eastern Shore, Ellen, Peninsula, Olivia, Norfolk, Summer, Portsmouth, Terry, Virginia Beach, Ellen Burgess, Chesapeake is Tom, Western Tidewaters, Connor, Richmond City is Kate, um, Chesterfield is Augustine Doe, and then South Central is Katrina. So we have 22 units. Um, and dedicated MRC unit coordinators to each of those units. What's um, important to notice on this map is you see we've got different blocks of color. So the different blocks of color represent our regions, and they're really affiliated with our healthcare coalition regions. So we plan in these regions, and their regions include the local health department, the um, hospitals, the healthcare systems, the dialysis center, the long-term care facilities. Anybody that provides patient care comes and works together in these coalitions. And so the MRC is a very important key component to these coalitions and the ability for the coalitions to provide care to the community in emergencies. So wanted you to be aware you're part of a much bigger infrastructure, a very collaborative and integrated infrastructure for public health and emergency response. And who are our MRC volunteers? Um, we have every type of healthcare professional that there is in the state of Virginia um, as a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. And we have a veterinarian, Sam Tate. He has been fantastic throughout the years, and he's been working doing um, contact tracing. Um, he also has worked flu vaccination clinics, and he has worked in doing rabies vaccination clinics for animals out in the community. So some of these positions you might not think of could be utilized in public health, but we can cross train you to do a lot of different things and it also broadens your experience with public health. Um, we obviously are going to need vaccinators, but there's a lot of other aspects that go along with just doing a vaccination. Um, we need non-medical support. I think I I don't know what the, the ratio was on the slide. I think we're 60% medical, 40 non-medical. Um, so we need teachers where there's a lot of health education, um, a lot of organizing groups of people and trying to keep people going in the right directions. Um, social workers answering the phones um, and those call centers has been absolutely um, an asset to us. I can't tell you how much we need Spanish interpreters. We need Spanish interpreters. Um, if you have looked at the COVID numbers, um, our ethnicity that has the most number of COVID cases are, is our Spanish population. We had two very large outbreaks on the Eastern Shore in poultry facilities. Um, so that migrant population, Creole, Spanish. Um, if you are an interpreter, you are desperately needed. If you know of somebody that speaks Spanish and would be willing to help, please encourage them to volunteer. They are much needed. Um, and really, everyone has something to offer. We have some ham radio operators. We have you know, people that help pack supplies. These are some students working in our vaccination um, kind of rolling boxes, uh, and they were helping to pack supplies there. What are our expectations? We need you, but what do we expect of you now as an MRC volunteer? Please remember this, do not self-deploy. Just because you hear that another MRC unit volunteer is doing something, um, it doesn't mean that you are needed. So please do not self-deploy. Please do not show up at a hospital. Please should, do not show up at a vaccination clinic unless you're notified. Um, we need for you to complete the training that is required. Um, respond to your alert notifications. Um, I'm gonna tell you how to do that in just a minute. Um, be dependable. If you can't come, please let us know. Um, Keeping in contact with you is very important, so we need your information to stay updated. I say our number one requirement is that you're caring and you're, that you have a commitment. Um, that once you do show up, you are committed to being there. 
um, you know, we understand that you are a volunteer and, uh, and if you're not available, just choose not available. If we, you are, we want you and we want you to be committed. Um, and also that you're representing the Medical Reserve Corps, that you're wearing the red shirt, you've got the star on you. I hope you're proud um, to wear a star on your shirt. Um, we say our MRC volunteers are rock stars. Um, so you're part of a, a large um, stars throughout the state. But you're also representing the Commonwealth and the Virginia Department of Health as well. So we take that um, very seriously as a responsibility to be public health champions and representatives. And I have to put this on here because the reason why you can't self-deploy is that um, we want to prevent you from one, most importantly, keep you from being injured. Um, you know, not all locations are safe. Um, my, my pastor um, has a team of volunteers that does disaster response and they use chainsaws to cut down trees. And, he, we had a, a small tornado come through a small area in our community, and I learned that he was just going to go and help, and I said to him, um, have you been contacted to go? Well, no, but I know trees fell. Well, how do you know that there aren't power lines down and roads aren't blocked and things like that? I was like, well, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Uh, we don't want you to figure it out. We want to send you there when you're needed. We want to be able to send the right people in the right place at the right time. And also, if you self-deploy, we cannot provide you with any of the liability um, coverage that you have as a Metal Reserve Corps volunteer. And when you represent us, you are representing VDH. Um, we have had more media. I have done more television interviews sitting in this chair than I have ever done in my entire life. Um, and we would love to facilitate you talking to the media. If you are at an event and uh, media approaches you, um, please defer them to the public information officer or your, your supervisor. Um, if that's not the case and you're contacted through Facebook or some other way, please talk to your MRC unit coordinator. We've had volunteers on NBC Nightly News, um, on, uh, gosh, it's been just, local TV, uh, had like three volunteers on WRIC. So a lot of uh, great positive press and we'll be happy to help you represent us. So, um, you know, more legal stuff. Um, we are um, providers of health care. Um, public health information and health information is shared with us by our patients and clients. Um, even the fact that an individual was a patient is um, protected health information. So if you're doing a point of vaccination event and somebody from school that you know drives through and you say hello to them, you can't go home and tell your significant other that you saw them at the vaccination event. Okay, so we take that very seriously. So um, there is at the um, bottom of the orientation uh, page that you've got the link for this. There is the link to our liability and HIPAA acknowledgement sheet. Um, that was provided to you when you submitted your application in VVHS, but if you did not review that, I strongly encourage you to review that because you've already acknowledged it. What is very good um, that we have in Virginia, and not all states have it, is that um, a law was passed to provide liability coverage to our Medical Reserve Corps volunteers and CERT volunteers when they're under the direction of the Virginia Department of Health. So you will have the same protection that any public health nurse has, any state employee has the same coverage that you have as a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. There is a lot of other Good Samaritan laws. I mean, it's like 13 pages. Um, if you would like to read the 13 pages, we've created a separate page there on um, the links here on the PowerPoint. And you can also download this PowerPoint presentation. I'll post it this afternoon if you would like to take a look at that. And you sharing information about other patients, but we have access to your information as well. Um, it is managed by our MRC unit coordinators, the emergency coordinators, myself, the MRC state admin team, our training coordination team, we all help to manage your information. We only share it on an as needed to know basis. 
Um, and when you register, just again, that agreement, you agreed to allow us to share your information when it's necessary for deployment. If you have provided a social security number on your background investigation, if you've gone through that process yet, um, we do not enter that information in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. It's provided directly to state police, and it is, um, it is, uh, it is uh, discarded appropriately, um, destroyed appropriately, so we don't have um, your social security number after your background investigation has been processed. Now, that's all that administrative, what we do stuff. Now we're gonna move over to, I like to be the fun stuff. It's kind of the, um, the train that runs um, our learning and then the backbone of what runs our learning manage our Virginia Volunteer Health System, our volunteer management system. So you all have been to this website um, and completed an application have an application approved, we're notified that your application has been approved. Um, if that's not the case, we will we'll make sure you get through that process. Um, so when you come back to this page, I do not want you to go over here and hit this blue button on the left-hand side of the screen. Okay, don't go there. I want you to go over to the other side of the, the screen where it's the yellow box and enter in your username and your password and click the sign in button. If you have trouble logging in, make sure you just hit that trouble logging in um, link and that'll take you to the screen so that you can reset your password. Um, if you have any other problems, there's that connect a contact us link that'll take you to the Virginia MRC email and our admin team, Laura or Carrie, would be more than happy to assist you in getting access to your application. When you log in, you're going to see um, your dashboard, which is going to have a um, list of all of your recent alert notifications um, and your account information. Then over to the left, you can download a deployment report and a training report. I might be able to slide one of those over and show you what one looks like. I think I have, I have a training, a deployment report, and I'll show you that in just a bit. Um, so this is what the screen looks like. Now, if you come over to the My Account button, this is where you're gonna have access to all the information that's entered about you. Um, this is what you um, look like to us when we're looking at your profile. It shows us how many deployments you've been on. The star would be your picture. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to upload your picture if you don't have one. It shows us who you are, what level you are as far as an MRC volunteer or medical volunteer level one or, um, works in the hospital, um, which district um, you're associated with, which MRC unit and whether or not you have a badge. You can change all your information. So if you click through the top of the screen where it says overview, um, you hit the account button and you click Overview, that's what we were looking at. Now I'm looking at the contact screen. You can see um, all your information. If you wanna make edits to it, you can click any time over here to the edit button. If you don't see the edit button, that means you do not have access to that page. So it'll open up and we just added legal first name. So maybe you submitted your application and it, it doesn't have your legal first name. If you're logging in, if you can make sure that that is correct. And then if you did not upload a picture, we would love for you to upload a picture. Um, I've given three picture examples here um, of our sample volunteer, uh, Zeus, the therapy dog, and um, giving you some options. So we're gonna select which picture would be best. I love my niece, Ashley. This is an adorable picture. And Zeus there with his bow tie and then over here with his other bow tie. So of the pictures that we have selected there, the best picture to choose would be the Zeus with the bow tie smiling, but also the solid background and just from the chest up and straight on. So much like your driver's license picture, but you're allowed to smile in your MRC profile pictures, please do. Um, and we just want that head on shot uh, to go into your profile picture. So if you uploaded something that maybe wasn't appropriate or you would like to change it, go ahead and do that. That's the picture that we're gonna use to print your identification badge. 
So you have the option to choose what your badge looks like in picture. So definitely go and do that. You can hit the select image button and click save and that'll um, save the picture. Again, if you have any problems, you can email us and we'd be happy to help you. Then um, I talked about updating your contact information and your contact information is really important so that we can contact you when we need you. And you can come in and there's two different sections. One, there's the content, your, just your phone section. So you want to enter your home phone number or whatever information you want up here. That does not necessarily need to be the information below for your phone and text alerts. You probably don't want your home phone number to be one that you're calling all the time. VDHS would be calling all the time. It more than likely you just want to put your cell phone number in here, maybe your work cell phone number as well if you have one. And you can choose whether or not you just receive a phone call or you receive a phone and a text message or just a text message. The majority of the alerts that we send are email and text. When we really need you quickly, we're going to add in the phone option. The other section that it's important for you to have updated into your profile is your credentials. Um, you can upload pictures of your identification. So um, if your picture of your driver's license can be uploaded in your profile in VBHS. If you have your driver's license, and your profile picture in VBHS, we can automatically run your background investigation without having to fill out any forms. And that more quickly expedites you becoming a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer and being deployable. So that helps us and it makes you faster to being a volunteer. Then there's the health information. So you can enter in that you have a Department of Healthcare profession, Health Professional License. Um, you can enter in a picture of that. Um, any other health licenses that you have, you can upload multiple of those, click the add credential option, um, and you can remove it as well. So it's pretty self-explanatory, you know, add credential, use the blue buttons to upload your information. So we want to have all of that into the Virginia Volunteer Health System so that we can prepare you to respond. And we're going to talk a little bit about TRAIN. It is our learning management system. It is the gateway to so much information um, that will allow you to become a more um, knowledgeable volunteer about public health and emergency preparedness. Um, you already, if you have an approved account in VBHS, you have a train account. Yay, we did that for you. Um, so your train account email is going to be the same email that you're using in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. Okay, it was automatically created. I'm going to show you a few screens here in a second. But train itself um, is just a wealth of resources from FEMA, from CDC, from University of North Carolina School of Public Health. Um, it really, and VDH training has uh, just so much um, at courses that you can take. Many of them have CEUs. If you're looking for CEUs, look at the course descriptions. Scroll down to the bottom of the course descriptions and they have, um, it'll tell you what's required for CEUs and how to obtain them and how many you get. Um, you can go to train through your account in VBHS. If you go to the training page, you can click on uh, log into train and it'll automatically take you there. But please do not create a train account. If you have problems logging into train, let us know. We'll help get you in. We have a great train um, administrator, Brad, and um, he's super funny and he'd be more than help, happy to help you. So there's training that you can complete now. Um, we have Incident Command System 100 and National Incident Management, um, Management System 700. There's Psychological First Aid, and then we have several epidemiology courses. If you go to our main training page and you scroll down to the bottom, those courses are there. Um, there's several different blocks that open up and tell you all the courses. Um, so feel free to go ahead and complete those. Um, there is contact tracing courses. There's a course on isolation and quarantine. Um, there is a behind the scenes of an outbreak and it's focused around Ebola. So if you would be interested in learning about what happened with Ebola and how isolation and quarantine applied then, um, it's a great case study.
lots and lots of educational opportunities. And if you can't go out and do a lot of things, now it's a good time to complete them. So um, when you're in your, your account in VDHS, and remember we just went over and we updated the credential section, you can click over to training and it is gonna take you to the page that is going to list your, your train user IDs. This is your user ID number. Oops, clicked the wrong. Um, that's your user ID number, which MRC unit you're registered in. And then um, if you wanted to log in to train, you can just click the train um, button right there. If you don't have a FEMA student ID, you have to apply for the FEMA student ID via FEMA. So that's a link to that page to do that. And then um, there's a link to find more volunteer training. So um, that's a page. And then underneath it on this page, list all the different trainings that you have completed. All right, you're ready to go. Your information's updated. You've completed the training. So how do you get there? How do you get to being deployed? Um, and know that we, when we are deployed, it's not just us. We are always working with other partners. This is um, a great example of um, a deployment of, with partners. These are volunteers who supported um, first aid tents on the National Mall during the inauguration. Um, we didn't do it, we usually do the inauguration and July 4th, we didn't do July 4th this year. Possibly we'll be doing the inauguration. We have volunteers that were at the tents next to the Lincoln Memorial. We were working alongside the disaster medical assistance teams, um, our US public health officers there in the fatigue all the way over to the right, and our National Park Service. So we were all working together to provide first aid um, to the individuals that were participating in the, um, in the inauguration uh, activities. So you're activated when we receive a request. So when the local health director says, I need five case investigators, when the National Park Service says, I need volunteers to be in our BLS first aid tents, that's when we notify you. We use the Virginia Volunteer Health System to do that. And you'll be able to sign up for roles and shifts. Gonna show you how to do that. And you'll be receiving specific instructions um, via your alert notification in VBHS. So we use our alerts to notify you about all different types of activities. Um, and that could be the drug take back event that we talked about earlier, the homeless outreach event. We send out notification drills um, when we're not busy. Um, and just to know that if you don't respond, you might get the same alert again. So whether or not you're available or not, just let us know and then you won't get bugged by the unit coordinator. We have a little special button that says, please send back to the people that did not respond. We have um, alert classifications. So this is just a way for you to know kind of how important this is. So communication, use it's gonna be a newsletter. Awareness might be a, hey, heads up, um, the hurricane's coming, please make sure you have your plans together. Readiness is we're putting together a team, we need to know if you're willing to be on the vaccination team. We are putting together a team to staff shelters um, in Virginia Beach because um, the hurricane's coming and we need to know how many volunteers can be activated for shelter operations. Um, so then activation is you are needed. We are now sending you deployment instructions. Um, we use emergencies when the activation is when needed within less than 48 hours. So if we need you immediately, we're gonna send it as an emergency. And then a deactivation would be a stand down. We're no longer um, needing volunteers for that deployment. When you receive an alert, um, it is going to come to your email and the email is gonna look um, like this formatted. It's gonna have a link in it. Um, this alert here is about Special Olympics. So we had volunteers that provided um, health screenings and education for Special Olympic athletes at the event in Richmond. Um, Richmond City, Henrico, Chesterfield, MRC unit supported this. If you click on a link, you're gonna get a special box that pops up that's just uniquely for you. Um, and it's gonna open up and it's gonna give you kind of more of the facts about the event. So what 
are we doing? Um, when are we needed? Where are we needed? Um, how do I register? And what additional information do I need to know? See, this one was a training alert and Paula had sent it to any volunteers that had not completed the orientation um, and wanted them to complete 100 and 700. So if you were interested in attending this, you would click on the blue button. If you were not available, you click on the red button. And then that would let her know um, whether or not you could participate. Now, if something changed and you talked to your husband after dinner and you found out you had plans you didn't know about, you could always come back to this email and come in and click this link and change your response. Um, and what we will do if we're no longer, if we've, if we've identified everybody that we are using, we'll expire the alert and you'll no longer be able to make that change, um, then you'll need to contact your MRC unit coordinator. Now, we're looking at some very large deployments with multiple shifts and multiple locations and multiple days. Um, and it is not uncommon that you might be getting an alert that could have 20, 20 choices. Um, we're sending out alerts for the point of entry health screeners and for the call centers. And we send those out once a week and it'll have the ability for, for you to make your selection for different days and times. Um, this alert here only had two options you can see. Um, sometimes we'll say what the role is needed, um, if the person needs to be a registered nurse or not. Um, for our point of testing, it might say um, pot tester. Um, you know, we kind of joke, coronavirus, beer, we use pot tester. This isn't a very healthy <laughs> acronym that we're using, but um, we said we were gonna start giving out flower pots to all of our volunteers that did the point of testing. <laughs> so we thought that would be more applicable. Um, so you might see that they're looking for point of testing or general support um, listed there if it was a testing event. But again, you click in the buttons to say which one you're available for. And then if you're available for any of them, it says I'm available for the ones I selected or I'm not available for any of them. That is how we get responses via email. Other than email, you can get e phone messages. And in the phone messages, it can record whether or not you are or are not available. So it cannot do the, I'm available this many days and times. So you would need to click one if you're available and two if you're unavailable. Um, you cannot respond via text messages. So please make sure to check your email and go ahead right now and um, save the 804-864-7200. We want you to put that, um, in your contacts, in your, in your mobile phone, because that's the phone that, that's the number that's going to come through and it's not a spam person or it's, you know, not somebody that you don't want to answer. You want to put MRC alert and that way when you get that, it's going to come across that that is your phone. Your text messages will come the same way. So it's going to have a number at the front of it and it'll say, you know, MRC volunteers are needed. Um, you can also save that in your contacts as well. So it's always, it'll say VVHS, yeah. In the, in, the, in the text messages, it says VVHS and then whatever the um, SMS message that we've entered for you to receive. So go ahead and put that in. That's the phone number that's gonna be calling you. And when we call you, we want you to be able to say whether or not you're available or not. And the decision of whether or not you're available is yours. We need you to look at that alert and decide if you're qualified or not to volunteer. So am I personally, um, hey, I'm gung-ho about going to this. I know COVID is a little scary, but I know by protecting myself, using PPE, following the instructions that I'm provided and doing the just-in-time training, I'm going to be just fine and I'm going to be ready to help people in my community um, and whether or not you can make the you know commitment to be there so um, I love this oh pick me I'm ready to go I'm so excited I'm here at orientation please call me tomorrow I'm ready to go um, you may not get called tomorrow it might be a few days um, but we hope that you'll be able to say pick me this is a little bit more um, it is applicable probably a little bit more for um, 
or hurricane response. Um, but you really need to understand the nature of the request. So if you're a nurse and you haven't provided clinical support in a, in a long time, maybe you're retired, um, it's okay if you say you do not want to be a vaccinator. Not every nurse wants to vaccinate kids and adults, and that's okay. We need nurses to do a lot of other things. So make sure you read um, the alert to say, yes, I'm comfortable with doing this. No, I'm not comfortable with doing it. Or I would be comfortable if I got a little bit of uh, just-in-time training or a brush up of my skills. So you'll need to make that decision. And sometimes things are just not right for us right now. Um, you know, maybe you have um, a senior family member at home. Um, so we didn't encourage our family members, um, our volunteers who had high risk sen senior family members, of course, to go into long term care facilities. Um, so make sure that, you know, your life isn't chaotic, that things, um, it's the right fit for you right now. Um, you know, CDC has changed the guidelines. Um, there's no longer the 65 or older. It's if you're older and have health um, compromised or higher at risk, um, you're encouraged to stay home. You're encouraged not to volunteer. But if you're 68, 70, and you are as he healthy as you have ever been, and you're like, I'm there, I'm not worried about an age limit, I wanna volunteer, then we want you to volunteer and we'll put you in ways that you can volunteer safely. Um, we, there's opportunities to serve in those low risk positions at the call center. Um, everybody wears the appropriate PPE. Um, we have safety officers at events. So there are risks, but we want to make sure that you are as safe and protected as possible. So always know it's okay to say no. I know you're very excited and you signed up now and you might be getting these alerts. Don't feel guilty if you can't hit I'm available. It's okay. If you've gone back to school and you're like, man, everything's happening right during that one class. I would love to do it, but man, it just hasn't come up. Sit on the sidelines. Um, be there and be ready to jump in because there are gonna be a lot of opportunities. So when you do go, we want you to know that we respect and understand that you are a volunteer and it's definitely up to you to decide whether or not you can participate. It is voluntary. I know it's a little bit of um, not a perhaps accurate perception of medical reserve corps. Um, and that was the name that was given, um, you know, many years ago to our program. Uh, it probably should be public health reserve team um, because we're not like in the military it's not like we're in the army corps or the marine corps um, we're the staffing workforce of public health um, and that is not only medical obviously it's non-medical as well so it's a little bit of a misnomer um, so just because it says core does not mean that we're absolutely obligated you must be there um, my boss would probably say that because he's the ex-colonel in the Marine Corps and he would say it very, <laughs> very colonel-like. Um, but always wear your badge, always wear your shirt if you have one. Um, this is the, um, our regular shirts. We have the burgundy shirts that say VAMRC COVID-19 on the back. They're the ones that you've seen in a lot of the pictures that I've shown. Make sure that you do follow instructions. We really need to make sure that you sign in and sign out, that we know you're there and we know that you've left because part of our safety plan is to account for all of our staff. So if we were doing an outdoor um, you know, uh, vaccination event and some weird storm came up, we're gonna make sure that we wanna check off that everybody is there um, and everybody is safe. So please sign in and out, not only for safety, but also to document your hours. Um, we have job action sheets that tell you what you should do. We have just-in-time training. If you review that job action sheet and you're not comfortable with that, that position that you've been assigned, you should tell a supervisor and do not serve in that position. That is okay. Um, make sure you wear appropriate clothes. Often in our deployments, we'll say, you know, you're going to be standing for long periods of time. Wear a pair of tennis shoes, you know, no sandals, uh, you know, no short shorts with, you know, cutouts. You, you know, you want to represent yourself well. Um, you want to be comfortable and safe. 
Um, you know, you're going to the inauguration. You said he saw those ladies were bundled up. You couldn't see their MRC shirts because uh, they were wearing so many layers and hats and, and that's okay. We want to make sure that you're healthy and safe. And do you know, um, best laid plans, probably one of the most difficult things that we have to do is sit on the sideline and wait. Um, you know, when we got the um, request from the state of North Carolina to deploy volunteers after Hurricane Florence to support shelters in the state of North Carolina, um, it, things changed constantly and we hurried up we hurried up. I'm, I sent an alert out on a Saturday night at eight o'clock and we had 32 public health nurses and MRC volunteers. I think we had nine MRC volunteers in rental vehicles by 3 p.m. on Saturday, rolling down the road to North Carolina, going through, I mean, amazing. They got there, it was the hurry up like you haven't hurried up before. Throw all your stuff in the car, you're gonna get there. They got there and they had to sit in an old Kmart building for like 18 hours waiting to get their assignment. On cots, you know, um, austere conditions. And then, I, this is just a story. I mean, you know, you wouldn't, I never would have thought you wouldn't have dreamed these things up, right? Never underestimate the willingness of a volunteer. That is my quote. And it constantly, um, that quote is reinforced. So with these volunteers, wonderful, two volunteers, and they were so dedicated. One was a, a, a retired Navy corpsman, and they drove almost 10 hours through North Carolina trying to get to this one location. And the roads were so flooded, they were turned around and they were told to go to the hospital. And they sat at the hospital for, pretty, for several hours. And they were picked up by helicopter by the National Guard and lifted by helicopter and taken to this community that could not be gotten to, two nurses, and they served in a shelter there for over a week and a half. And the locality gave them a vehicle to drive and gave them a place to stay at, at a hospital 45 minutes away. And they were there and they worked. Semper Gumbi, always be flexible, okay? Always be flexible because you never know, you might come to an event and you're a nurse and you weren't planning to do something and the next thing you know, you're doing a job that they needed you to do just because you're a nurse and you had the skill set that it wasn't what you thought you were signed up for. So always be flexible. Um, this is incredibly rewarding work. Um, it's stressful. I mean, those volunteers that went into that long-term care facility, that was tough, you know, really tough. And some of them did it 12 hour shifts. We had volunteers that drove over to the Eastern shore some of them three plus hours back and forth. Um, and they stayed overnight. Um, but that going and helping seniors that are in that type of facility is, is tough. Um, so know that some of the jobs are gonna be pretty easy. Walking the community and handing out flyers. I mean, if you're an outgoing person, that's up to you. Um, but some of the things are you know, not as easy as walking around in the neighborhood. But you do have to know that there's just so many benefits of stepping up and saying yes and serving your community. Um, and, you know, we are amazed. I stand in awe. Um, I like that. I'm kind of in um, a pattern. I said the word behold. I stand, I pause, I look, I stand in awe that, you know, we've had volunteers provide 75,000 hours and 2.2 million dollars of volunteer work. And I haven't even started to look at July and August yet and I know we were doing over 180, I think it was 180 testing events just in, in July with volunteers. Some of them 100% staffed by volunteers. But do know this is a great opportunity for you to develop friendships 
Um, many of our volunteers have worked together. I mean, those volunteers have been working together at the call center for six months. I can tell you they're friends now because when the phone's not ringing, you're talking to other people. Um, and it's a great opportunity to network. It's been wonderful to see that we have some retirees that are volunteers that have been able to mentor some of our students. Um, I've been in a flu shot vaccination clinic before. I had a volunteer with me. She walked in and we had some public health nurses. And she, I, you know, I didn't know how they were gonna, you know, if they knew each other. She literally like ran up to the volunteer, Winnie, and gave her a huge hug. And I was just like, what is this? It was her nursing instructor, like from 10 years ago, you know? So it's a really, nursing and doctors, it's a small world. And when you put all of these really wonderful people together, I'll be surprised if you don't know somebody. Um, because we're such a big group and we have networked together. So there's just, um, thank you for being a part of our team. Um, and, you know, really, I think the benefit is knowing that not only are you serving your community now, but that you have the opportunity to continue to serve. So if you're not available for a couple of months, that's okay. Jump back in the game whenever you're available. What I want you to take away from this presentation is that you are always representing BDH and you're always representing the Medical Reserve Corps program. You will be activated when you are needed. So when you're sitting on the sidelines, take training, read up, study, um, reach out, be a public health champion, tell other people in the community, encourage your family to wear their masks, <laughs> stay six feet social distance. Boy, that's an education struggle sometimes. Um, you know, make sure you respond to alerts, um, talk to the media when it's coordinated. Um, you will have a train account created, so make sure that you use the account that's created for you and really just stand by for deployment. Hopefully now that you've completed the orientation, if we have your picture and your driver's license in your profile in BDHS, we'll go ahead and start processing your background investigation. If we don't, we'll more than likely be contacting you to get that information. So what's next? Um, application approved, background investigation done. Um, you gotta get that identification. So actually today, I believe in Henrico, we're doing a mass um, a point of drive-through ID. So um, volunteers are driving up to the health department and we're handing out badges and shirts and a goodie bag. Um, so we do that sometimes on Saturdays to be able to distribute a large amount of shirts and badges. We I think we have um, printed over 8,000 sh shirts, 8,000 VAMRC shirts, so that we're giving those out. So we'll need to get that to you. Go ahead and complete that online training and wait to be mobilized and demobilized. Um, and really to you know, know that you are um, a valuable member of our team. So don't log off yet. We have a few other things, and I'm actually running on time, which is fantastic. We have roll call. Um, so what you need to do to verify that you're here and Megan um, is our COVID-19 deployment coordinator and she's in the chat box. Um, she can put this link in for you, but our secret phrase to document that you were here is VA MRC rocks. You're gonna see that a lot on our Facebook page and I say it a lot and we actually have Virginia MRC rocks for real. I should have brought one in. Um, so you're gonna document your participation that way today. If for some reason you have a problem, you can email training at vamrc.org and Adrenia can help you with that. So um, I say thank you. Um, thank you for choosing to volunteer. Um, thank you for choosing and serving in your community as a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. Um, the State Health Commissioner, our Secretary, um, uh, Dr. Carey, and the Governor, um, from leadership level, we are amazed. Um, and we look forward uh, to having the opportunity to do great work um, together as teams and units of volunteers doing um, you know, what is needed to improve and protect the health of everyone in our community. And um, I look forward to maybe seeing pictures of you on Facebook. Um, Gloria, Sydney, 
Todd, Jill, Susan Gill. Um, I've been talking to all y'all this morning, looking at your faces. Um, so, um, you know, maybe we'll have the opportunity to meet, but you're going to have the opportunity to meet as volunteers as well. But I do do Facebook Lives. So if you kind of like hearing me talk, you can go, watch, go listen to my MRC story. So on Facebook Live, recorded it yesterday on 9-11, because yesterday was National Day of Service and Remembrance. Um, so go listen to that story, because it's a good story. Um, and I will just go ahead and open it up. I know you might have been putting some questions in the chat box. Oh, I know two already, so I'll go ahead and answer them. Training. Um, we are providing um, CPR training to volunteers. Right now, we our priority for CPR training is for our vaccinators and nurses. We've received, um, using some of our COVID funding to do training for CPR. Now, we have an online training option through the American Heart Association. We've paid for the scholarships for volunteers to receive that training. So please communicate to your MRC unit coordinator, one, that you're interested in supporting vaccination efforts and that you do not have a current CPR certification and you would like to get a current one. We will be able to get you into the scholarship program. You'll complete it online. And we're trying to determine what is the safest way um, to do the skills assessment in-person portion of the CPR certification. But we're trying to go ahead and get that knowledge, um, the knowledge part knocked off virtually. And then we'll do the skills in-person. We'll have in-person vaccination skills training as well. The other question I didn't answer um, is EMS providers. Usually somebody says, I'm an EMT, what can I do? Um, according to the code, um, EMT providers can only provide that level of service when they're under the direction of their medical director at their, own, their EMS agency. Um, so if, you know, if you're affiliated with Loudoun County EMS, if you're a medical reserve corps volunteer, you can only do work as a medical reserve corps volunteer in the first aid capacity. If you are wearing your Loudoun County EMS shirt and reporting to them, you can do everything that they're allowed to allow you to do. So that is a typical question. Um, and I usually I get those during the orientation. So um, I will open it up for any other questions that we have. Um, Megan, if I, of course, I have not been watching the chat box at all because that would be quite distracting. Um, but are there any other questions that I can? Well, the first thing that I want to point out is a clarification note. So if okay. you don't mind going back one slide, Jennifer, sure. um, the VR, VA MRC rocks. So I see um, several, several of you guys have entered VA MRC rocks in the chat and we so appreciate it, but we really <laughs> need you to go to this web link here, the VDH virginia.gov slash MRC slash orientation, which we've put in the chat box a couple of times and actually enter that there. Um, so it, it does not, it doesn't do what we need you to do to enter it in the chat box, but we love to see that VA MRC rocks because we so agree with that. And I will show you, I'll slide it over on my screen um, so you can see what we're talking about. And Jennifer was asking um, if the exclamation point needs to be added. Yeah. Um, either way, right? Either way, it's fine. So you see on this page, it says after orientation, log your attendance. I want you to come and click on, click here. And that's gonna take you to a Google form where you just enter new volunteer state orientation. Thumbs up, that works. Just link right there on the web page that you do that. Thank you guys. So we did have a couple of other questions that were in the chat um, that I saved for the end. Okay. Um, a couple of them um, were a bit more specific, but some were general as well. So uh, to kind of start with the general one, um, one person asked, um, do you have any work for non-medical people that can be done remotely? And I know that you spoke a little bit about potential remote work for um, MRC volunteers, but if you could just touch on that as well. Sure. Um, it depends upon each of the health districts and what that they need. Um, like I mentioned, um, there is some contact tracing work that we've hired contractors for, but what happens is sometimes we have a really unexpected surge in cases and we can't hire more contact tracers quickly enough to address the need. And so volunteers will come in and augment. 
Um, so that's something that <laughs> once you complete the training that potentially could be done virtually. I know we have some medical and non-medical volunteers that are doing that in Portsmouth. Um, there are some data entry projects that can be done. Um, it really is, uh, you would need to let your MRC unit coordinator know and they can tell you what was available. Great. And then um, another kind of general question is um, that there were some questions about the required course trainings um, to be a, an active deployable MRC volunteer. So I did put some links in the chat for ICS 100 and 700 training, which is found on the FEMA website. Um, but just wanted to make sure that we address that one as well. Yeah, so right now um, we are mobilizing volunteers. Most units are mobilizing volunteers without the completion of 100 and 700. I've gone to the training page that you'll see on my screen, um, just MRC backslash training. And if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you see emergency response. If you click on that, it's going to drop down to the 100 and 700 course that I mentioned, as well as psychological first aid. Those are all courses on train. And then if you're interested in contact tracing, there's the contact, tra contact tracing case investigators training plans here. If you want to learn more about overall public health, what is Public Health 101? Um, this is here. There's an overview for the Virginia Department of Health for Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. Probably should put that as a required training so that you understand everything that we do. So click through these um, kind of accordion menus and you can find a bunch of courses that um, would be interesting um, to you. We've got isolation and quarantine. There's the behind the scene of the epi outbreak. Um, so those are courses that I think are very applicable to you right now as a medical reserve corps volunteer. The basic requ absolute required course is the one you just completed, orientation. Great, and then one last, uh, a bit more specific question. We had someone early in the chat that mentioned that they're an election official, ah. but they're also interested in doing, um, um, working with our infection uh, prevention ambassador program, and they were wondering if they could do both things at the same time. Um, well, it's awesome. Thank you for being an election official first. Um, secondly, usually the infection prevention ambassadors work during the election. So obviously you couldn't wear both hats, but we do have some of the infection prevention ambassadors that are doing the pre, um, training. So we, giving the briefing on how do you stay safe, how do you move on and off, you know. So certainly um, you could be that messenger of those, um, those messages. Um, I think, you know, often, you know, people just don't have that public health um, infection prevention hat on. And so it's helpful definitely when you are both. Um, we have we have two MRC unit coordinators that are election officials, um, one in Portsmouth and one in Prince William. Um, and we do, we have several volunteers that wear both hats. Um, and so if you are and you would want a volunteer who would be there stationed um, at the uh, polling location all day, then you could work with the MRC unit coordinator and the registrar. There's actually a, a, a request process. We are going to have um, a training on October 20th in the evening. I believe it's at 630. Um, and we will be teaching a training for infection prevention ambassadors for elections. So the deputy commissioner for the Department of Elections will present. Um, I will present and then we have um, a volunteer that is an infection prevention specialist who will prevent, pre present the core content. Um, and that will be about an hour and a half long training and really a requirement for all our, our infection prevention ambassadors. Great. Um, so we've had a couple of more questions um, in the chat. So one question was um, whether or not you could use um, any of the trainings or on-site um, uh, content that is provided to um, use as continuing education for things like uh, EMS. And I imagine that also goes for other 
other healthcare disciplines as well that require continuing education. Yeah, so um, um, I'm gonna pull over. So in, in the Virginia Volunteer Health System, um, I had to move her information. Um, in the Virginia Volunteer Health System, there's a button in that deployment screen and the training screen. And when you click on those screens, um, it says uh, PDF, and it exports this PDF that I'm showing you. So it would, it's a documentation of everything that you've done as an MRC volunteer and everything that you've learned as an MRC volunteer. So if it was needed, um, you could provide it to somebody to show that you've completed a specific training. Um, the CEUs are really determined by the different board of nursing, board of medicine, and EMS. They decide what CEUs are applicable for each courses. We don't have um, any control over that, but we do give you the ability to export the information and see um, so that somebody can see what you're done. Even if you're a student, this is helpful because you see here listed is, you know, here's the 100 to 700, the contact tracing courses, um, point of dispensing um, overview, uh, the STI information, all of that is listed there um, in that volunteer's training profile. Now, we also document deployments. So you can see this volunteer, um, actually uh, this, this volunteer is a pharmacy student at VCU. Um, and you can see she's done quite a few things. She's done community canvassing, um, uh, infection prevention screenings, point of testing, and you can see it documents what role she was in, how many hours, and it has notes about um, her deployment. So if you are a student and you would like to show your professor or somebody that you completed courses or that you did this um, type of service, you can download these documents yourself and just email them over to whoever um, would need them. Great. Um, there is another question um, related to um, how to go into the required courses again, but I just um, uploaded that website. So just as to reiterate, um, while Jennifer's on the page, you can just click on the individual tabs at the bottom of that website and it'll show you different, um, different available trainings and, you know, for different types of responses. So for example, if you're, you know, interested in the emergency response, as Jennifer has clicked on here, you can click on those individual training types that are highlighted. But I think that's all we have in the chat so far. So just to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, you're welcome to enter those into the chat. Uh, we are um, at 1132 right now, but um, I'm sure everybody's happy to stick around to answer any um, last minute questions that you may have. And you can also email vamrc at vdh.virginia.gov if you need any assistance in VBHS or train or anything else. I thank you so much for joining me this morning. Have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you.